Today's speaker is uh, Greg Shopman. He's a principal with the FMI Corporation. And uh, I asked him, I said, what is FMI Corporation? Uh, so that I would know and I could tell you, but they're a consulting firm uh, that's just for the construction industry. Uh, they do consulting for the construction industry and strategy, corporate strategy, uh, execution, and uh, getting work, okay? So uh, to me, that uh, is a very important topic for today. And uh, we've heard Greg before. He spoke at our convention last year, and uh, he's a very dynamic speaker, and I'm sure you'll enjoy him. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Greg. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Well, good afternoon. How are we doing today? All right. It's right after lunch, so we're going to keep the energy flowing here. Uh, Definitely excited to be back. Last year you did this program actually in Tampa, Florida, which is my home. So uh, I left yesterday, it was 82 degrees, and by the time I landed it was uh, 34 degrees, which I'm trying to figure where the, where the temperature went. Uh, as I was just <laughs> telling John, actually, I'm going to uh, Saskatoon in a few weeks, and I don't think they've actually seen the positive side of the temperature gauge yet. So, but that's the fun with FMI. Our home office is not too far from here, actually. I'm just, I think I'm echoing a little bit. Let me move that down. Hopefully you can all still hear me. I project fairly well, and, but I know I think they're recording this. Uh, our, our home office is actually not too far up the road in Raleigh, North Carolina. Some of you probably are familiar with FMI. We've been working with construction firms from around the world for about 55 years. And uh, construction industry is very much in my blood prior to coming to FMI. I was a construction manager with a company in Tampa, Florida, and traveled all over the country. So definitely understand the plight, especially what's going on now within the world of construction. The two topics that we're going to discuss today, the first one being estimating for advantage, i.e. the get work topic, and the second one is improving project performance, the do work topic. Duff made the comment that we're responsible for execution. And just to clarify that, there's always some little uh, piece of what are we, who are we executing. No, no, no. It's all about how we execute the work more efficiently, more productively, and more importantly, how we put more money to the bottom line and creating that consistency. So that's the piece we're going to talk about. We're talking about getting work and doing work. And there is a marriage there that we have to have. First thing I want to start off with is a, a very interesting conundrum, especially when we talk about getting more work or improving our hit rate. And this one takes on what I call the contractor's dilemma. And actually, I kind of coined this phrase. I did a, a piece fairly recently for an accounting firm in Minnesota. And some of the research that I did in this project actually led me to the world of basically psychology and mathematical theory. Give you a little background. Back in, I believe it was the 50s and 60s, during the height of the Cold War, there was a mathematician who coined the phrase, the prisoner's dilemma. Anyone ever heard that term before, the prisoner's dilemma? I'll give you a little background on that first, because it's kind of interesting. How many of you out there saw the movie, the, the latest Batman? What is it, the Batman Begins or something like that? The one with the Joker? Okay, you saw that movie. There was a part of that movie that actually illustrates this perfectly. It was towards the end of that movie, there were two barges in the river. And each barge was positioned to explode at any moment. They had a, 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 just a, a ridiculous amount of explosives on each ship. Now, on the first ship, you had a group of prisoners. On the second ship, you had a group of, you know, kind of everyday folks, business people that were going home from work that were using the ferry to go back and forth. Now, each one of them had a trigger, and they were to blow one another's ship up. And they had until a certain time before the clock struck midnight, for lack of a better word. And if they didn't choose to blow up the other ship first, both ships would blow up. So now the question is, do you actually blow up the other ship first to protect yourself? Or do you both kind of ride it out, hoping that you don't blow each other up? And that was kind of the, the whole evil uh, thing that the, the, the Joker created in that movie. And if you think back to the way this theory is created what we call the prisoner's dilemma. What do you do? There's kind of a zero-sum game that's occurring here. And back during the Cold War, we had the same situation. We had nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. If we launch a strike, well, what will they do? They'll launch a simultaneous strike. We'll each blow each other up and 
we have a zero-sum game. So now this brings up what we call the contractor's dilemma. You're probably saying, Greg, where are you going with this? We're not blowing anybody up. Ah, but are we? Think about this. There is not a lot of work going on right now. We're seeing the construction industry slowly languish. We're, we're, still, we're seeing some uptick in the uh, overall big picture construction market, but we're probably not where we'd like to be. Interestingly enough, we're seeing a lot of people do some very interesting things on bid day, simply to get work. So now the question is, do we A, go in and take whatever we possibly can, kind of fill our coffers with low margin work to keep people busy, but I would assume most of your organizations that are in this room have a finite number of resources. So the question is, as you're working through that low margin work, what happens if six months from now, a big project comes up that unfortunately is a high margin project? Do you have the ability to do that project? You all starting to see the dilemma that I'm creating here? But the problem is, can you wait six months necessarily till that good project comes around? And what if that good project never comes around? So we have what we call the contractor's dilemma. And unfortunately, folks, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't necessarily tell you your market, whether it be St. Louis, North Carolina, South Carolina, California, Saskatoon, wherever that might be, what's the, what's the market hold for you? But what I can tell you, there are some things that we can definitely do. I call it sweeping up around our back porch, things that we can definitely work on in-house to protect ourselves, to hedge against some of those things. May or may not have that big project six months from now, but hopefully with some better uh, tools to kind of provide indicator lights for us, this will give you some ideas. And the first piece of this, what I want you to be thinking about, actually through both pieces, is take two different perspectives. Take a step back from your organization for a moment. You know, some people, and I was with a group actually this week in the Bahamas. I know, it sounds like a rough gig, huh? And actually, as I was with them, one of the companies he was really, you could tell, he's very passionate about his business. This guy, he's, he started his business about 20 years ago. Entrepreneurial mind, very smart guy, and unfortunately, he was what I call breathing his own air. To where he's, you know, if you asked him a question about his business, he said, well, are you doing this properly? Are you in the right markets? His natural knee-jerk reaction was, of course I am. I started the business. Folks, this session here isn't necessarily primed to, to get you offended or to spark something. We know you all have great businesses, but sometimes we need to take a step back and look at it from a different set of eyes and go, what could I do better? What could I do a little differently? And hopefully with that in mind, as you start to look at the toolkit that you got in your business on the get work and do work side, you'll be able to say, well, we really don't have that. Maybe that is what's impacting our market. Maybe that's why we don't have all the work that we should. And hopefully when you start to think a little different strategically, and maybe some of the things tactically that you're not doing, or maybe you're doing but without a lack of consistency, you'll have a better opportunity. So we call this the hard, hard, hard bid world. I think we had that old mad, 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 mad world movie way back in the day. Obviously, scopes have changed significantly. You know, definitely, uh, we, we've had to make some cut some corners, so to speak. So what's going on in the world of construction? I'm going to kind of, just for sake of time, I'm going to give you some of what's happening in the world. First of all, the project speed and the complexity of your projects have changed dramatically. You know, we used to use the word fast track construction. Do we use fast track construction anymore, John? Why not? Exactly. Everything's fast track construction. I have one contractor I work with that calls themselves the hyper track contractor. Apparently that's really fast construction. Project change. We often hear change is inevitable. Well, especially on construction projects. When we couple that with, unfortunately, poor quality documents, this isn't to be critical of our structural engineers out there, but I'm going to tell you, things are, are changing dramatically in the world of engineering. And as a result, it creates more project change. Now, do our customers always want to pay for that change? I'd say probably not. The workforce demographics and attitudes. What do I mean by that? Workforce demographics. First of all, we have a changing workforce. 
I know no one in this room has ever said this before, but I have many, many a client that has workers that'll say, Greg, they don't want to work as hard as we used to. You know, these young whippersnappers, they just, they don't have good work ethic. You know, they want to show up at work late, they want to leave early, they want a two-hour lunch break. Not to mention, you know, they don't speak English, it's hard to relate to them, they're just, it's a different face. It's not like when I started in the business. You think that's going to get any easier? Probably not. Banking and bonding pressures. This is kind of the linchpin that we've got. We've got this point right now that unfortunately until that lending frees up, are projects necessarily going to be blossoming? Well, unfortunately, there are some folks out there are building. They're doing quite well. And a lot of that's because they're using the cash that they had on hand to actually build this. We're also seeing the rise of what we call the public-private partnership. It's kind of a mouthful there. Public-private partnership, we're taking funds from the private sector to do public projects. Let me make sure they're right. They're taking from the private sector to fund the public sector. You know, once again, you're seeing that particularly in... A, uh, there are several toll projects. I believe there's one up in Chicago. I know Florida's looking at that. God knows we need to look at something because there's not a lot going right in our state right now. Customer demands. You know, not to mention, we've got this downward pressure on price, but this upward pressure on demands from your customer. And unfortunately, it's squeezing out. You know, in some cases, John and I were talking earlier, our customers sometimes view us as a commodity. Wow, we're viewing us as a commodity. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The technology is ever-changing. You know, what was it the other day we just released iPad version 2.0? That kind of pisses me off. Guess who just bought the iPad version 1.0? You know, it never ceases to amaze me, but technology is constantly evolving. You know, as I walked around the, uh, your trade show, you know, obviously we're constantly seeing new tools, new equipment, new, new, new forms of, or new ways to enable us to do our work more efficiently, or supposedly more efficiently. The economy and the available work, obviously, that's unfortunately where we are seeing the uptick. But it may be different types of work than what we're used to seeing in the past. A more litigious environment, once again, as you just drive down, and I think if there's a, a billboard actually just outside of the Tampa International Airport when I come home. And uh, the, the, the picture actually is, is somewhat comical. You know that old milk ad that said, you know, uh, got milk? Well, this one says, got mold, and underneath it's got the attorney's name with his phone number, just blasted up there. Now, that's just something to consider. We definitely have a lot of attorneys out there, and unfortunately with this type of environment that we've you know, created, that's going to continue to be on the rise. Increased competition. I would guarantee you not only do we have maybe less work available to us, but there are more people that are entering our market sector, whether that be commercial, government, federal, design, build, whatever it might be, we're seeing more and more bidders. Uh, price pressures and tighter margins. Once again, we're watching materials go up. What, what's um, a, a commodity material or consumable material that's currently on the rise that's got everyone a little anxious? Exactly. It was a 335 a, a gallon at the pump. I think oil's over 100 and some odd dollars a barrel and continuing to rise, all because we're watching what's happening in the Middle East right now. And then the delivery methods. Once again, an ever-changing market as it relates to the different delivery methods available to us. Now, I painted a very rosy picture of our industry, very happy picture for right after lunch. The good news is everybody is dealing with this. Whether you're a steel erector in North Carolina, whether you're an electrician in Detroit, Michigan, or whether you're a general contractor in Tampa, Florida, we're all dealing with these challenges. Now, that doesn't mean we can kind of discount all the items I've listed up here and go, oh, that's not our problem. We don't have to worry about that anymore. What it does mean is we have to take a re, just a refocused approach and say, well, wait a second, what's on that list that we maybe have a little bit of control over? What's something on that list that we can pick out and say, that's something we can really change our business? Or if we do that better than the competition, we're elevating ourselves in different platforms. The one comment, as I mentioned, I was going to come back to is when we talk about our customers view us as a commodity. Think about that for a moment. Our customers view us as a commodity. We have to approach this from two perspectives. The first question is, A, are we a commodity? Now, some people will say that's a bad thing, Greg. No, no, no. 
we are a low cost provider. That maybe is what our customer views us as. On the other hand, if we say no, we're not the low cost provider, we're trying to find different ways to provide value, then guess what? You better find out what's valuable to your customers. Last thing we want to be is a square peg in a round hole. But that's the option we have, either A, be the low cost provider, and find out how to execute work flawlessly so we can drive more money to the bottom line, or B, find out what's truly important to our customers and find value there. Now notice I said what's valuable to your customers. The best thing to do is ask them, what do you want from us? I have many a client that I work with that they think they're providing value, and unfortunately the things that they think are valuable are not married up with what the customer thinks is valuable. There's a disconnect. So the key you have to ask yourself is, what is valuable to them, and can we do that? Can we do that with the equipment, the people that we have, the processes, or are we better suited to go back to being a low cost provider? Now, when I say low cost provider, that doesn't, that's not a bad thing. I think I shared with you the same story last year. You know, one of my clients wrestled with this. They're a general contractor in Manhattan. And they said, Greg, we don't want to be the low cost provider. We don't want to be considered the Walmart of the construction industry. I said, what's wrong with that? They said, well, Walmart, eh, it's cheap. I said, no, 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 Walmart is inexpensive. I said, the thing that we have to remember is, do you think Walmart's embarrassed, John, of being the, the Walmart of the Walmart industry? Actually, they laugh all the way to the bank. They're, what, the largest company in the world? Their stock price is through the roof. That's yeah, down a little bit right now. Their earnings aren't where they like, but heck, nobody's earnings where we'd like it to be. The thing is, they accept who they are, and you know what? And I'm not going to get into Walmart's business tactics or anything like that. There's some question marks there, but you know what? They said for us to be the low cost provider, we have to be a model of efficiency. So that way, that's what our customers want. You know, they don't want to walk into a Walmart expecting a low price and seeing Mercedes you know, on the front aisle there. That's not what you're expecting. The key is figure out what you are, accept that, and then figure out how to create processes and tools that are commensurate to that. Or find ways to deliver value. Many customers that I work with find themselves straddled on the fence. They're trying to do one thing, and unfortunately, they're getting caught on the other. A classic example of this was one of my contractor friends in Houston, Texas. We wrestled with this, and I had argument, bloody arguments about this with them. They said, Greg, we're not the low price guys. I said, fair enough. I said, but explain to me where you provide value. They said, well, we take them to lunch, we have golf tournaments, we bring them things. I said, that's not providing valuable, that's providing swag. I said, show me on your projects where you provide value. Then I said, if you do provide all this value, let me ask you, are you selected or is all your work negotiated? They said, no, we're one of four or five bidders. I said, then guess what? They don't find you valuable. It's simply put, we can sit here all day long and wrestle with something that we're not, but we have to create tools and processes that marry to that. So let's kind of talk about this a little bit more here. First of all, we've got the growth in bid work. Why do we have more bid work? Because people can, especially the people that have the money. Now, we can wrestle with this and say, well, it's those no good stinking general contractors out there. And I'm not here to defend general contractors or CMs, but we probably have to think further upstream. Where is that pressure coming from on those general contractors and CMs? It's probably the end users in a lot of cases. So we can cast some blame on them. Government procurement practices are changing and evolving. Yeah, once again, we're seeing the rise of uh, minority businesses, 8A, veteran-owned businesses. Once again, these are some just robust markets for a lot of people that have the ability to do that. Cutting margin is not a bidding strategy. Let me, let me go over that again just in case we didn't hear me. Your bidding strategy doesn't, get, doesn't mean you go into the war room on Tuesday and start slashing numbers like it's a fire sale. I had one client, I was in their conference room, and it was very, very comical actually. I was doing some work at the end of the conference room table, they were doing a bid check at the end of the room, and they were arguing back and forth. They come across a line item. They had it in for $10,000. 
And the estimator looks at the, the CEO, the president, says, we can't put that in for $10,000. Steve down the street's going to put it in for $9,000. So guess what? We slash, we rationalize away costs all the time. Now, if you think you can do it more efficiently for $9,000, that's one thing. But arbitrarily slashing your cost simply to keep up with the Joneses, that's not a good way of doing it. Simply put, you don't know how John down the street or Steve or Mary or Sue puts in their work. Maybe they have a more efficient structure than you. That's just something to consider there. But simply cutting margin is not a bidding strategy. And lastly, evaluating your estimating function to drive out an efficiency and increasing performance. These next, what I consider, uh, let me come back to this one here. These five elements are the pieces that we're going to review right now. What I want you to do is benchmark yourself. When I go through these, kind of do a mental Rolodex and say, yep, we do that. Nope, we don't do that. And these are the things when I go back to my home, I'm going to work on. I'm going to assign some teams, some champions to work on these things. Let me go back a couple slides. I didn't mean to skip ahead. I've shared with this before. This is probably one of my favorite slides because when we talk about going from suspects to the actual awards, the funnels change. We obviously need a bigger funnel. So that, where do we, what does that mean? We need to be doing a lot more fishing. Now, coming from Tampa, being right on the water right now, you all can see we have to be fishing off the dock, fishing off the beach, fishing off the back of the boat with long lines, with nets, whatever it means, we have to do some things a little bit differently. So what are the things we should, a bare minimum, expect from our estimating team or estimating department? First of all, cost certainty. What's interesting with cost certainty, in most organizations I work with, there's a disconnect. We have the estimating or get work function of our business in a silo, and we have the operations function in another silo. And for whatever reason, the two shall never meet in the middle. And in a large part, we have the estimating department that churns through and they create some level of cost, certainty in their mind, and they send it out into the field. And what does the field say? We can't do it for that. So that's the challenge. How do we manage it? And this is not to blame the estimators. I think the operations folks are also culpable in this. When we have a situation where operations doesn't provide feedback, or we don't have a scorekeeping system that actually can let us know what can we do this work for. So the, better, the first question is, do you have a mechanism in your company where you have a good, healthy, robust cost accounting system to where you know what you can do work for? What does it cost you to put up a column, to hang girders, to put decking down? What does it truly cost you? And more importantly, does that close the loop from estimating to operations back and forth? Or do the two live in a vacuum? And rather than actually objectively talk to one another, they throw darts across the aisle. It's a very important piece to be thinking about. Scope clarity. Not only does estimating have an understanding of scope, but here's the key question. Before any bid goes out the door, whether it's a hard bid, whether it's negotiated, whether it's design build, however you execute your work, <coughs> excuse me, let me ask you this one fundamental question. Do you have an approach? What do I mean by that? If you can't answer this fundamental question, you have no business bidding on that job. What is our key on this project, or what is our ace in the hole. Because what will happen if you don't have either a better way of building that mousetrap, if you have a better approach, maybe you have the relationship with that GC or whoever you're building this project for. Whatever that is, if you can't answer that question, we probably shouldn't be bidding it. Simply for the fact that do we have an edge? I'd say in most cases we probably don't. We're just going to get caught in that number churn, and we're, we shouldn't really be surprised when, unfortunately, we don't get awarded that project. So the fundamental question, as we're getting ready to send that bid out on the fax, on the email, drop off the proposal, whatever it might be, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is our edge? Do we have an edge? If we don't, throw it up, put it in the garbage. 
Subcontractor quality. I know some of you use subs. The sub of a sub of a sailor man. In this case, who are our partners on this job? Do we know a lot about these folks? Do they give us the edge? Maybe that's the edge we're talking about. Overhead efficiency. You know, once again, appropriately sized. You know, and do we have the right people doing the right things? I see many in a department, unfortunately, when we talk about this get work function in a business. People confuse certain titles. Business development, marketing, estimating, and sales. People say, yeah, I'm all of those. It's a little bit challenging to be all of those things simultaneously. Now, I know if you're a smaller business, and I'm sure we have some here, you gotta wear a lot of hats in your business. I understand that. But fundamentally speaking, those four things that I just described are four different roles in your business. And in some cases, you also have estimator slash project managers. Anybody have that typical structure in your business? Folks that sell are also the ones that are ones responsible for executing the work. We see that quite a bit. But what I'll tell you, we have to think about, do we have the right people doing the right things? And if we call someone a salesperson slash estimator, is that necessarily the same thing? I'd say in most cases, the personality types are completely different. Salesperson is out kissing the baby, shaking hands. An estimator, probably a little bit more focused on the actual drawings, what's our edge on this project. Once again, it's not to say or put people in a, a particular box, but we have to get people where their strong suits are. And lastly, I say it again, what's the edge? What's our edge on bid day? That is the key question. And think about this, the last project that you put out in your office, what was your edge? When you go back to your room tonight, right before happy hour, not after happy hour, that's not a good thing, but right before happy hour, just jot down, did we have it? Did we know someone maybe at their company that we have a strong relationship with? Is our president on their board or something like that? Or did we have an in on where we're getting the steel from? Maybe we had a better rental price. What was the edge? Some key things to realize when we talk about cost drivers. My favorite one is field labor productivity. This is the world that I live in. I work with contractors all over the world, helping them improve their labor productivity. And let me tell you, 33% is what we call recoverable lost time. We've done time, or basically time studies across companies, and what we do is we go out and we find they can be, most of your crews can be doing one of three things. Putting work in place, planning to do the work, or doing none of those other two things. It's that simple, folks. Putting work in place, planning to do the work, or simply doing nothing of the above. Wasted time. 33% of an eight-hour day is spent in recoverable lost time. 33%. What was that, two and a half hours, I believe? Now, keep this in mind. This study does not account for breaks, lunch, going to the Johnny on the spot. But even if you take all those breaks out, how much time is wasted? Now, I do want to just put another asterisk on this. This is not to say your crews are lazy. This is not to say we have people that are just kind of milking the clock, so to speak. What this is basically saying is, people get ready to put the work in place, and unfortunately, they don't have the materials they need. They're waiting on an answer, an RFI from the engineer, waiting for materials to show up that the project manager or the office forgot to order. And unfortunately, we've got to quick ship it out there. This is time that is spent wasted. Two and a half hours. It's a lot of time, folks. 37% of all construction materials are wasted. Once again, that's a pretty big chunk of change. I refer to this one as death by a thousand paper cuts. I'll give you a good for instance. One of my clients, they said one of our consumables that we go through a lot is plywood. And I know you guys are in the steel market, but this was kind of an interesting study because I said, you go through plywood. And I said, and secondly, I said, how is that a consumable? They said, well, we do a lot of forming for projects and we use a lot of plywood, you know, and I said, okay, I understand. I said, but how do you go through so much plywood? 
They said, well, we order it at the start of the job, we ship it out to the job site, and it's for you know, putting up form work. Well, what happens is they got this big bunk of plywood, and no sooner does someone walk up, they say, ah, oh, I need one sheet of plywood. I just got to go ahead and rip a, rip a quick piece off. So they take the top sheet of plywood. Hey, there's still 48 sheets laying there. It's no big deal, right? Pretty soon they start going through that stack, one piece by piece. Pretty soon there's nothing left. How often do I see concrete contractors? You know, they got all those cow pies all over the job site. You know what I'm talking about, right? And pretty much they, they order 10 yards of concrete, but they only actually need eight. So what do we do? We slough off the last two. That's just two yards of concrete. It's not a big deal. You know, order extra deck. What's the big deal? It's just a, it's just a couple feet. This is the death by a thousand paper cuts. It's not that you have a, a massive cost impact to your job, but when you count that over time, over a year, how much does that impact you long term? For instance, there was a great book fairly recently. It was called Switch. To get a chance to pick this one up, fascinating book. It was uh, the author that wrote, also wrote the book Made to Stick. Give you a little background. He said they actually did, did a study on this one particular company on safety gloves. And what he did, he went in and grabbed every type of safety glove this company had. And he piled it on the conference room table. He stacked a pile of safety gloves on this conference room table. And if you can kind of envision this massive table, probably you have a lot of these in your boardrooms or conference rooms, and it was stacked to the rim with different types of safety gloves. The point was, here we had all this, you know, people would go out, I just need a pair of safety gloves, it's not a big deal. They spent on average, they blew the budget for this one particular company by a little over $100,000 a year in safety gloves. Now that's not to say you don't need safety gloves, but for the simple fact there was no consistency, there was no accountability to purchasing one type of glove for that matter. But when we start to view it as a consumable item, ah, just throw them and it's not mine. What's the big deal? That starts to add up. One pair of safety gloves at two bucks or three bucks or whatever you might pay for them, not a big deal. $100,000 worth of safety gloves, that's an issue. Equipment utilization. Yeah, as I sat and looked at the equipment out in front of the, uh, the tent, the lunch tent, I got to thinking about this. How often, it, it was actually recently, I, I went by the uh, Ritchie Brothers auction outside of Orlando. I was actually I headed to Disney this weekend. And it was interesting to see all the equipment lined up. And they have thousands of pieces of equipment if you've ever been to a Ritchie Brothers auction. It's a, from a construction mindset, it's, it's kind of exciting. I will admit my wife didn't find it nearly as cool as I did. But what I found interesting was, think about your job sites. Do some of these job sites look like Ritchie Brothers auctions? What do I mean by that? We see some superintendents that line up those just like we had out there, the cranes, the lulls, the man lifts, the scissor lifts, and we got equipment out front. None of it's being utilized, but we forget to take it off rent. Or maybe we're not renting the equipment. Maybe we own the equipment or we're leasing the equipment. And unfortunately, we forget to take it off rent. You know, how often do those costs start to impact our job? It does have an impact, but unfortunately, some of our guys have the mentality, well, we own the equipment. What's the big deal? Yeah, we're just taking it from one pocket and putting the other. But if we don't instill a sense of ownership, that doesn't even go into the piece of the, what we call the strategic leadership on this. Should we even own the equipment? Are we better off leasing it? Something to consider. And lastly, close out. Do we actually account for that in our estimates? You know, I have some contractor friends I work with in the punch list and close out phase, they put a week in the schedule. What was the last time a punch list ever took a week? I have some contractors that take six months to close out a job, yet that's what they have in terms of cost. And are we fooling ourselves? Now, will our customers always give us six months of punch lists? No, probably not. Or more importantly, six months of general conditions to do said punch list. So the catch is, are we really kidding ourselves in the fact that we run an inefficient operation? So here are some drivers just to paint the picture of, do we have an accurate understanding of this when we look at our work? <coughs> so now we're gonna talk briefly about these different, what we call the 5S model. And what I want you to do now is once again, 
be able to check off some of these and say, we got it, these are the things we've got to work on. First of all, strategy and alignment. This goes back to your strategic plan. What are you chasing? Are you chasing everything? I have a contractor I'm working with in Detroit, Michigan right now. And I actually went out, I talked to 31 of their customers, are they profitable projects? That's the way we have to look at it. Get a manager that can motiv motivate and lead a team. In some cases, the senior estimator for many firms is simply the, folk, the person, guy or gal, that's the best estimator. And unfortunately, there's a huge difference between leading people and estimating projects, managing people and taking off work or estimating work. So you need a manager of your department, of that get work silo in your business. Who's leading that? Is that you? Who is that that's taking that role? Oh, and then no logistical barriers in those silos, just to kind of go back to that. That's pretty self-explanatory, but making sure that there is a vehicle, whether it's the post-job review on your projects, you have to have some vehicle that they can talk to one another. First of all, the standard processes, and I'm going to show you a flow chart in a moment, but where is the wasted time in your process? You know, there's probably a lot of time when we say, that's not really providing value added to this estimating process. You know, do we have a detailed cost history database? Folks, I know general contractors that have some of the most robust databases of costs. They have it down to how much it costs to put up a purlin, how much it costs to erect a, you know, just put up a joist, weld it, whatever it might be. But there are some contractors that unfortunately that are just simply doing a trade, drywall, steel, plumbing. They don't even understand those costs. You have to get that cost history, folks. And I hope, if anything else, you'll go back and look at, do we, when we look at these last projects that we did, these last five years, can we gauge performance? So many of my clients will just simply look at the end score. They'll look up at the big scoreboard in the sky and they'll say, well, we made 10%, what's the big deal? Yet they truly don't understand what makes up that 10%. Or did we make the money or was that simply just a, a swag? And to illustrate this example, I work with a mechanical contractor in Mississippi. This is a very, very telling story. I asked them, we, we, we're coming in to do a little debriefing with them. We sat down. I said, guys, how's the market? They said, we're getting killed, Greg. We were doing well about four months ago, but we've started to see just a very scary trend of our competition throwing out lowball numbers. I said, really? They said, yeah, our competition's doing some stupid stuff right now. And I know some of you probably have experienced the same thing. They said, give you a for instance, we just bid a $300,000 project. Our bid was $340,000. The low bidder was $300,000. That's what got the project. And then he said, there's no way, Greg, they can do it for that. They're just throwing a stupid number out and see if it'll stick. I was like, fair enough. Well, what was funny is we got into their costs. We started looking at things. One of the things that they were doing was they were estimating with a blended rate. And basically, their estimate in terms of labor rate was, and I'm throwing out a number right now, was $35 an hour. Those in Detroit were famous for it. They said, Greg, man, this is a tough company to work for. You know, we have just, we've got all kinds of folks on medicines and, you know, they're taking, you know, Xanax and, you know, all, you know, all kinds of stress medic, heart medication. I said, well, one, we can't take the stress out of construction, but unfortunately, is that self-inflicted? And I venture to say a lot of us like that self-inflicted nature. So, when we talk about improving productivity, what are we referring to? Here's another series of questions to think about in your business. <coughs> By the way, this is for those of you that are old FMI fans, um, this actually is who we refer to as Emil. The silver fellow is Emil. Doc Fails was the fellow that actually started our business, and probably a lot of you know us as the Fails Management Institute. Doc Fails started the business back in the 50s. We've kind of dropped the Fails Management Institute, mainly as you can imagine. It's not exactly a re re resounding endorsement, but uh, especially since this is all we do. But needless to say, this fellow is who we called Emil, 
And we modeled our productivity model after this. You know, having productivity tools, people, and processes. We call it the P-cubed model. Notice we didn't call it P3. We heard there's someone else had that one. How we measure it and apply consistency are very important. And then the principles are what we're going to talk about right now. So the question is, do you have these four elements in your business? Do you have good pre-job planning? Notice I didn't say turnover meeting or handoff meeting. I hate the word handoff meeting. Nothing pisses me off more when I see companies go, Greg, we got that pre-job planning stuff. We do a great handoff from estimating to project management. You know why I don't like the word handoff? Because it just sounds like what we're doing is the dump and go. Here we go. I'm an estimator. I'm going to pitch the ball over to John. John, good luck. Knock yourself out. I'm going to go back and estimate. Once again, if your pre-job planning is more of a dictation than a collaboration, you don't have pre-job planning. Once again, if it's a, your pre-job planning is handing over a job book, once again, the key word there, handing over. If we sit down and we discuss the project and we go, what's our approach? How are you, John, going to maximize our profitability on this one? Mr. Superintendent, Mrs. Superintendent, what are you going to do to help us be effective on this project? How are we going to erect the steel? You know, what, what's our strategy here? That takes a little bit of forethought. It takes a little bit of, once again, forward thinking to be able to do it, but that's pre-job planning. How do your crews do their short interval planning? Do they actually run through on a weekly basis and think about what their crew is going to look like, what issues they're going to have, those rocks in the road that are causing them problems? Or do all our superintendents and foremen, when you ask them the plan, they, it's all up here. Don't worry about it. I got it up in the big cabeza. That's not planning, folks. That's when we wonder why our cell phone bills are through the chart. Daily huddles. How do we start off each day? Do we simply just start off the project with a, all right, guys, go and did what you did yesterday. Unfortunately, they were incredibly unproductive yesterday, so that means today they're going to be unproductive again. Or do we actually sit down and go, this is what we're going to do. We're going to erect from column line J to column line M. That's our task today. Think about football. You know, do they start a football? I mean, we just had the Super Bowl a couple weeks ago. Does the quarterback get up to the line and, you know, Aaron Rodgers, you kind of look at the line and go, okay, guys, Ready? Score. He don't do that, does he? No, we execute a play. Now everyone understands we're going to maximize that effort and do whatever we can, but there is a, a method to their madness. Exit strategy. Once again, does your business, remember when I talked about earlier, we get to that punchless phase, or more importantly, the closeout, we're buttoning up all the steel, and unfortunately, we kind of maybe lag coming over the finish line. Or maybe we take our superintendent or foreman that was running that part of the project and we ship them to start a new project. They're getting ready to start a hospital, so we move them off. Do we have an exit strategy that we hand off the information to that other new superintendent or foreman? Or do we get to that point and go, all right, folks, this is the part where we start to suck wind. This is the part where we really struggle crossing the finish line. And unfortunately, this is also what ties up your retainage with those GCs and CMs. So do we have a process that we go through and we say, okay, let's go figure. Where are we with our open items? Well, we've got to finish the decking on the third floor, all right? You're going to take care of that one by when, all right? Where are we with as-built drawings? All right, well, I've got to work on that one, so I'll put that on my to-do list. And that becomes our action plan so we can finish strong. Folks, this is what our customers remember most, is how you finish, not how you start. I can guarantee you. And I've, more importantly, I talk to so many of my customers' customers, and I ask them, how did my team do? And I hear it all the time. Well, they started out great, but they really sucked wind across the finish line. My, one of my favorite quotes I heard was, they started like a racehorse, but finished like a mule. That tells a lot, folks. That's what your customers remember. How do you finish? And then lastly, the post-job review. Just want to check our time. Oh, we're doing great. How does your post-job review look? Do you go back? And notice this is a cyclical loop. This feeds back to pre-job planning. Do you have a process where we go back and look at what we did well, what we didn't do well? Notice I said both. 
I have many customers that will say, oh, Greg, we look at all the failing jobs. We look at the stinkers all the time. Well, that's good. I imagine everyone in this room does more right than they do wrong. I'm hoping that's the case. Why don't you look at success? I think we can learn and garner a lot of knowledge from that information. When we define these, or define these definitions, it's somewhat redundant to say, but we're talking about what are confusing to some people. We have productivity, production, and profitability. First of all, what do your customers care about? Production or do they care about productivity? Absolutely. They care about production. They don't care if it costs you a thousand people on your workforce. They want production. What do you care about as a business owner? Productivity. We want the most amount of output for the least amount of input. Now, when we also throw that profitability word in there and we say, well, have we ever been profitable but not productive? I'd say, yeah, we probably had that before. We've been profitable but not productive. Those jobs are far and few between and they probably haven't happened in a couple years. Those are the jobs where you could stub your toe and still make money. Have we ever had a situation where we've been productive but not profitable? I'd say there's probably a case of that too. You know, in many cases, our crews are incredibly productive, but maybe we had an estimating mistake. Or maybe we just simply didn't, weren't able to do, we kind of cut those costs on bid day, and that impacted their end result. Once again, people use these words synonymously, though. I have many clients who will say, our production's great, Greg. That's fine, but is your productivity where you want it to be? because your productivity will ultimately impact your profitability. They're not synonymous. So how do you use these words? And do your crews understand those words? When we talk about this particular circle, this is a, I'm beating a dead horse here, folks. You work for that pink circle. It's kind of ironic, a bunch of big steel erectors and I have a pink circle, I didn't think about that one. But we talk about that's our world. If we are not in the business of making sure that pink circle has everything they need, we're doing ourselves a disservice. We work, I don't care whether you're in the business development side or whether you're the CEO, you work for them. And your job is to remove those obstacles and enable your crews to be successful. When we accept that, then we come, become better organizations. How do I make the crew the most effective and efficient machine they possibly can be? And that's who we serve. So lastly, when we talk about some of the, those principles, these are those sticks that were hanging out of that wheelbarrow in that front slide. Consistent use of these management processes. The key word, consistent. I don't care whether you have two people in your management team or 20 people. You have to drive consistency. There needs to be the ABC steel erection way of doing things. Not the Joe way of doing things, the Mary way of doing things. So the rhetorical question here is, do you have one way of doing things in your company or 20 ways of doing things in your company? Use of productivity tools is essential to success. Once again, not only do we have the processes, but the checklist, the agendas, the cost reporting systems, those tools, are they consistent across our firm? Number three is simply probably the most impactful, folks. Changing people and personal behaviors is the hardest and most challenging thing. Folks, I got a computer up here. I must have 300, 400 companies worth of tools, processes. You know what? I'm a dorky engineer. I have an engineering and a master, or a bachelor and a master's in engineering, and I got to tell you, that stuff is easy. Changing Butch to do it this way. Changing that project manager that's done it 40 years this way. Changing the superintendent over here. That is the biggest challenge. I've become more of a psychologist than an engineer in my life. Measurement and feedback are absolutely critical, folks. You can have all those processes and tools, but if you're not going to measure the consistency, those upstream metrics, you have to make sure people are following the company's system. And how do you do that? You measure it. If you have a pre-job planning system, you make sure people are using that pre-job planning system. Education and training are important, but you're not going to educate or train your people to prosperity. Simply put, that's like giving someone a Ferrari 
or a Lamborghini, one of those really fast cars. And unfortunately, what you tell them to do is go drive on an old country road with potholes, big lime rocks laying everywhere. You really can't open up that car. I mean, you could probably go 30 miles an hour before you blow on an axle or something like that. So you have to find a way to make sure that you have a smooth and a good infrastructure that they can open up. You need those processes and tools first, and then you train those tools. Does that make sense to everybody? Simply put, people will say, well, we send our people to training. We send them to Purdue or an FMI program. And then we expect them to come back, and without that infrastructure in the company, we get a couple good nuggets, maybe 5 or 10% of some good things. But unfortunately, we're not able to do it when we get back to our business. An effective productivity improvement initiative is something that's strategically formalized, led, and managed. The gentleman in the back talked about safety. I can guarantee you the safety in your organization didn't happen overnight. You didn't come back from a program or a safety class, an OSHA 10 hour, 20 hour, whatever it might be, fall protection, and go, okay, folks, we're going to be safe today. And it was like a light switch. Everyone became safe. No, what happened is you said, we're going to be safe, and we're going to go out and we're going to hire a safety director. We're going to go out and we're going to make sure our people are, have all the safety gear they need. We're going to give them some education. We're going to measure safety. We're going to make sure that they're all going out and getting educated themselves. Point is, it took time. Same thing here. You have to have it over time and you develop that. It's a journey. It's not a destination. We never get there and say, well, we're now productive. So some of the high impact process we talked about already. We also talked about material management, you know, inventory, you know, handling and all those things that are related to it. You know, measurement, our cost budgeting, our production. Once again, how do we measure those things and what are the vehicles we use? Manufacturing, once again, prefab, modularization, all the pieces of our business. You know, these are big trends within the construction industry. Do we understand modularization and prefab and how are we integrating that into our business? Some of us say, well, that's the first time I've ever heard about prefab. Oh, go out and get some education because that is a huge part of a lot of the large general contractors and CMs across the country. You know, most folks out there, we have done a lot of studies, myself and one of my colleagues in Tampa. Most companies find that 5 to 10% is well within reason, easy to get and very important to get. And when we talk about that 5 to 10%, that's money that goes right to your bottom line. So if you spend a million dollars a year in labor and you improve productivity by 10%, you, know, you don't need to be a mathematician to figure out that's money that goes right into your pocket. I sound like Sally Struthers now, just for 5 cents a day. But the point is, we have to drive that money. That's efficiency. Comparison of what people will spend in terms of safety versus what they send in productivity improvement. Just to give you some ideas there. Field manager by age group. I could spend an entire another hour talking about the impact of the aging workforce. But when we did our study, this kind of gave me an idea. Field managers. You know, the good news is they're in that 36 to 45. I'd say, what are we doing to supplant that last group right there? Because we got a lot of people that are well, maybe you're sticking around a little longer because their 401k isn't where they want it to be. But most importantly, what are we doing to extract knowledge and make sure we have a good cadre of people coming behind? Consistency in project managers. This is one of the studies that I wrote and developed, and some of you probably got copies of this. We have a tried and true company way, and there's little deviation from one manager to the next. The point was we had a two samples in this. They were folks that were on time and on budget, and folks that weren't on time and wasn't on budget. It's that simple. Look at the interesting dynamic between the two. The on budget, on time folks, they had a company way. Versus folks that were, we have process and procedure, but application varies. Unfortunately, that was the not on time, not on budget group. Folks, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I can quickly tell you that if you have a system and we manage it and we drive it, we're going to be more effective and make more money. Project leaders, folks. I have many a client that have what we call project witnesses. And one of my clients, I actually sat in his office, a $100 million contractor. I sat in front of him and I said, let me ask you, 
how many project managers do you have on your team? And he said, two. And I'm sitting there, I'm kind of going through, counting on my fingers. Like, ten, 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 ten. like, wow, that's a lot of money for two people. And he starts laughing at me. And he goes, Greg, you asked me how many project managers I have. I got two project managers and I got eight project victims. I got eight people that watch the job go by. He goes, none that actually stand up and lead. He goes, I want people that will lead the project, that have an understanding of processes and will make us more money long term. Folks that understand that budget information and promises, they're the linchpin, once again, that translate to buildings, profit, and realities. I mean, it's, a, it's simply put, we have to manage those expectations from our customers, from our field managers. You could easily put superintendents and foremen in that. They're the throughput. So the question is, what do you have? Do you have project managers, or project superintendents, or project victims, project witnesses? Where do we stand in that? So lastly, and I've said this before, folks, there are companies that are making money right now. Some of us may be doing better than others sitting in this room. So the question is, are they making money because they're lucky? I don't believe in luck, folks. You know, I was just in the Bahamas recently, and I can assure you, I'm not a lucky person, especially at that casino. So the question is, are, we, are they lucky or are they doing something different with their business? Are they doing something different strategically and tactically than you? I'd say yes. That doesn't mean that the music stops. We can go out and figure out what that is. And if you look at some of the tools that we've talked about, it's not an overnight transformation. But what are you doing in the get work and do work silos? What are you doing differently? Or are we still doing it the same old way we've done it for the past five years? Have we evolved? Have we looked at our markets, our customers? I guarantee you they've changed. Have we kept up with the music? Companies trend independent of the market, which explains why there are people that are being very successful right now. Following the crowd and simply kind of getting into that shuffle becomes a, a chase of the lemmings at that point. And that we have to be very careful of. Number four is pretty much my favorite saying. Your firm is perfectly designed for the results you're getting today. Simply put, if you like what you're getting today, you're, you're perfectly situated. If you're not satisfied, if you're sitting there right now and you're frustrated and the things I've talked about, you're kind of scratching your head and you're going, why aren't we doing some of those things? then you've got to make change. And change isn't easy, but it's inherent. It has to occur. And simply put, activity does not equal results. It's the same thing. The fellow that I drove around with on those job sites, folks, he was very active. Oh, he was very active. Was he productive? No. So once again, activity in the, in the business development sense is the same. Just because we got work coming in the door, that might not be good work that we want necessarily to have in our business. The key, folks, use this time. You know, as you're flying back, or not you, Duff.